Hi everyone, and welcome to The Never-Ending Story, The Cultural Evolution of Narratives, Part 4. In this lecture we'll be talking about soap operas, and whether their cultural evolution has been influenced by a content bias for social information. This lecture is by me, Joe Stubbersfield, and Jamie Tarani. Soap opera. Social dramas, i.e. those where conflict is centred around the relationships of a group of characters, is by far the most popular TV genre. The social aspect of this drama is epitomised by soap opera. These are widely popular, open-ended stories about the day-to-day -day lives of a more or less closed group of characters, such as a family or work colleagues. Examples from the UK include EastEnders or Coronation Street, while internationally examples might be the American Days of Our Lives or the Australian soap Neighbours. The success of these soap operas may be explained by their appeal to social content bias. But what are content biases? In the field of social learning and cultural evolution, we consider a number of heuristics and biases which influence the transmission of information. Context biases refer to our disposition to learn certain types of information or copy certain behaviours based on the context in which they're presented to us. So it might be model based in that we might be more likely to learn information from or copy prestigious individuals or successful individuals, or they might be frequency dependent. So we might be more likely to copy behaviour that we see commonly through conformity. Or on the other hand, we might be more likely to copy behaviour or learn information that we perceive to be rare. For this lecture, we'll be focusing on content biases. Content biases refers to a cognitive disposition towards preferentially learning, recalling and transmitting certain types of information over equivalent others. These dispositions may have evolved as useful function in our evolutionary past and they're likely to have shaped the way culture has been transmitted and has evolved. There's a range of these different content biases, but today we'll be focusing on social information content bias, as this is the one that's particularly relevant to soap operas and social dramas. But to begin thinking about why we might be biased towards this social information, we have to think about why humans are so clever and how we're so unique compared to other animals. So some of the things that make us unique are our exceptional cognitive abilities. So we have theory of mind, where we're able to consider other beings as independent agents with their own motivations. And we also have levels of intentionality. So this is going beyond simple theory of mind, but being able to not only just think of others as independent agents, but be able to conceive of them thinking about others as being independent agents themselves. This is well illustrated by the drama Othello, where the audience has to understand that Iago intends that Othello imagines that Desdemona loves Cassio. This is an example of four levels of intentionality. Humans have a cognitive optimum of about five levels of intentionality, because once you get beyond that, it starts to become too complicated for us to fully understand and retain in our minds. We're also capable of social learning and are highly dependent on that and highly focused on learning from others. In terms of explaining why humans have these exceptional cognitive abilities and why we have this uniquely high intelligence, there are two key explanations. The first is an ecological explanation, which suggests that we evolved the higher intelligence to keep track of food resources and predators, to create foraging techniques and to hunt. A second explanation focuses on our social environment. This suggests that we evolved higher intelligence to keep track of complex social relationships in large groups. And this is this explanation that we'll be concentrating on. A key part of this is that we have large brains for our body size. This is something that was observed by Aristotle centuries ago. 
who stated that of all the animals, man has the brain largest in proportion to his size. And Aristotle was absolutely correct. This figure shows body weight by brain weight, and you can see that humans have particularly large brains for our body size or our body weight relative to other animals. We also have qualitative differences in our brains compared to most other animals. We have a disproportionately large neocortex, and this is the area that, which is used for social computations and complex cognition. This figure shows the mean group size of different species of primate and their neocortex ratio, that is the relative size of their neocortex. And you can see in this figure that the larger the mean group size, the larger the neocortex ratio. Primates being a social species for the most part, have to keep track of a lot of social knowledge. Cliques shift, coalitions reassemble, and status and dominance climb and fall. So there's a lot of social relationships and complex social relationships that have to be kept track of, especially in large social groups. Taking all of this together, Robin Dunbar suggested the social brain hypothesis. He proposes that primates need large brains because they live in unusually complex societies and that we need to be able to manipulate and manage information about the changing state of the social group. So the suggestion of the social brain hypothesis is that increasing social complexity drives the evolution of increasing intelligence, which in turn allows us to have better communication, such as language, and also sharper social skills, like being able to manipulate others and form alliances. Of course, these social skills and this communication increases social complexity, further increasing our intelligence. So primarily, the suggestion here is that our human intelligence and our exceptional cognitive abilities evolve to, to form and keep track of social relationships in a complex social network and also to enhance effective communication within large groups. So what are the consequences of having this social brain? One key consequence is social information bias. So this is a content bias, which means we are disposed towards social information over equivalent non-social information. It means we're susceptible to content which ticks that particular social box. So this also means that we're biased towards fictional social relationships, as well as information about our real life social relationships. So how might social information bias affect the cultural evolution of narratives? And think about this question, we can look at the example of a study I conducted with Jamie Tarani and Emma Flynn. So in this study, we were interested in testing for social information bias in the cultural transmission of urban legends. Urban legends are a type of contemporary folklore which might feature hook-handed serial killers or alligators in the sewer, but also feature social mishaps and embarrassment. They are often told as true and might be told as something that happened to a friend of a friend. In this study, we used a transmission chain design. So you'll remember those as being where the first set of participants or generation one is given the original material and then they have to recall this original material and the product of their recall is used as the material for generation two and so on down the chain. And this allows for examining the cumulative effect of transmission. In our study, we used urban legends containing social information survival information or a combination of the two and these were used as material to be passed along the transmission chains. Here are some examples of the material we used for the experiment. All of these are genuine urban legends that have been passed around from person to person but we edited them somewhat to be suitable for the experiment. This is an example of one of the survival legends we used. When beehive hairstyles were in fashion it was almost a competition to see which girl could get her hair the highest. 
There was one girl who got her hair so high and put so much hairspray on it that she never took it down, combed it or washed it. One day she suddenly fell ill and died. They found out that a deadly spider had nested in her hair and laid eggs. When the eggs hatched, the baby spiders bit into her scalp and poisoned her. So you can see that this contains survival information because it involves someone interacting with their environment and the deadly consequences of that interaction. And this is an example of one of the social legends we used. The boss of a small company took his attractive secretary out for a long lunch on his birthday and they enjoyed some drinks together. Afterwards, the secretary invited the boss up to her apartment for a few more drinks, which he readily agreed to. At her apartment, she left the room to slip into something more comfortable. When she returned a few minutes later with a birthday cake surrounded by the man's friends, family and his wife, they found the surprised man waiting in nothing but his socks. You can see this contains social information because it involves the interaction between third parties and their relationships. And this is an example of one of the combined legends we used, which featured both social and survival information. One night a woman heard a baby crying outside her door. She rang the police because it was late and she thought it was weird. The police told her, whatever you do, do not open the door. The woman said that she was worried that the baby would crawl into the street and get run over, but the police then told her that a serial killer has a baby's cry recorded and has been using it to coax women out of their homes so he can kill them. So this legend contains both social information because it involves interaction between third parties and also because the threat is a social agent, the serial killer, and also contains information directly related to survival. We found that urban legends containing social information, so those which were either the social information legends or those that combined social information and survival information, were the most faithfully transmitted along the chains. And you can see that in this figure here. Those that contained survival information had more faithful transmission than the control material, but were still significantly less well transmitted as in less was recalled along the chain than those legends which contained some kind of social information, suggesting that the process of transmission benefits content which has some kind of social relevance. However, when thinking about how content biases might influence the cultural evolution of narratives, it's worth looking at the narratives themselves in the real world, as well as just examining them experimentally. So we also conducted a content analysis of 254 urban legends, which were collected from the internet. And these were coded for the presence of content biases and related content. So you can see the results of this content analysis here. And from this content analysis, you can see that one of the most frequently coded biases was social information bias. So 77% of all the urban legends that we collected featured content which exploited this bias for social information. And this was much higher than survival information bias or stereotype consistent content, suggesting that our bias for social information is really shaping the way urban legends at least evolve and are transmitted. So in conclusion, the social brain hypothesis proposes that human intelligence evolved in response to demands of complex social groups and relationships. This leads to social content bias, a preference for socially related content and information and stories which appeal to this bias will be culturally successful. You can see that Soap operas and social dramas are very likely to tick this particular box. They're very likely to exploit our bias for social information. And this may well explain their success in our media.